The Endosymbiotic Theory of the Origin of Eukaryotes Life on Earth is thought to have arisen approximately 3.8 billion years ago, as simple single-celled bacteria capable of consuming naturally occurring molecules to grow and divide. These early life forms are referred to today as prokaryotes, unicellular organisms without membrane-bound organelles. However, much of the life we see around us today is eukaryotic, comprised of trillions of cells that contain organelles separated from the rest of the cell by lipid membranes. The endosymbiotic theory offers a method by which eukaryotes could have evolved from the simple prokaryotes that began life on Earth to the complex interrelated organisms that now shape the way we see our world. Fossil records indicate that living organisms arose on Earth as early as 4.1 billion years ago, although this figure is disputed. Most widely accepted theories place the appearance of living organisms at 3.8 billion years ago, likely near shallow water hydrothermal vents where mineral precipitates provided easily accessible nutrients. When these living organisms first arose, the Earth did not have an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Earth's early atmosphere was likely composed of carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, methane, and trace amounts of ammonia. However, the atmosphere of the Earth changed relatively quickly due to the appearance of new metabolic processes in cells. Early cells had limited functions, being capable of little more than reproducing, but as mutations in the genetic code of cells accumulated, some cells gained the ability to synthesize complex molecules from smaller organic molecules, or to break down large molecules into smaller ones. These cells had an evolutionary advantage over others, and over time, became more and more prevalent. Many of the most efficient metabolic processes that arose in those cells are still preserved in cells to this day, particularly the storage of energy from reactions within the cell in adenosine triphosphate. Cells that could break down large molecules and rebuild them into smaller molecules to harness the stored energy were not entirely reliant on the outside environment and proliferated in conditions where others could not. The modern-day process of glycolysis, splitting glucose into pyruvate, occurs in almost all known living organisms. Glycolysis provides energy for the cell by transferring phosphate groups between intermediate steps of the breakdown of glucose. The energetic output of glycolysis is two molecules of adenosine triphosphate, which cells use for metabolism. While not very efficient, the evolution of glycolysis helped early cells overcome the barrier posed by obtaining energy and to evolve further mechanisms. Early forms of photosynthesis likely arose after glycolysis, using energy provided by sunlight to build up glucose from the hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide found on early Earth. This glucose could later be broken down for energy. Due to the abundance of water, which could be used instead of hydrogen sulfide to create a proton gradient, processes that used water were selected for over processes that used hydrogen sulfide. Using water instead of hydrogen sulfide caused the release of large amounts of oxygen gas, which eventually accumulated in the Earth's atmosphere. The accumulation of oxygen gas in the atmosphere allowed for another breakthrough in evolution. Aerobic respiration, the breakdown of glucose into carbon dioxide and water, using a proton gradient to generate more adenosine triphosphate. While glycolysis alone only produced two molecules of adenosine triphosphate, aerobic respiration generally produces 30 molecules. This jump in energy production would ultimately lead to the separation of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Approximately three and a half billion years ago, prokaryotes separated into two distinct groups, archaeobacteria and eubacteria. One and a half billion years later, another group arose, eukaryotes, more complex in structure than bacteria and archaea. Archaeobacteria and eubacteria have generally minor differences in cell structure and metabolic processes, and are closer genetically to each other than either is to eukaryotes. However, archaea are closer to eukaryotes than bacteria are. This led some of the first scientists to study the evolutionary history of these domains to hypothesize 
that eukaryotes evolved from a common ancestor with archaea, with no influence from bacteria. This hypothesis of the evolution of eukaryotes was initially accepted, but as new evidence arose it became clear that it was inaccurate. Numerous scientists' research into the structures of eukaryotic cells, mitochondria, chloroplasts, bacteria, and archaea indicated that eukaryotic cells arose in a different manner. Many scientists proposed theories based on this evidence, the combination of which would eventually culminate in endosymbiotic theory of the evolution of eukaryotes that we know today. Examples of symbiosis, a relationship between two or more organisms, are common between organisms in nature and had been observed long before humans could observe individual cells. For example, some species of ants farm fungi as a food source, with both organisms benefiting from this mutualistic relationship. Symbiotic relationships can also drive evolution in the organisms, either dividing a population or creating an environment that prefers a certain trait to become prevalent. In 1883, the French botanist Andreas Schimper was studying chloroplasts in plants and observed that chloroplasts divide in a manner similar to cyanobacteria, a group of organisms that also obtain energy through photosynthesis. Schimper proposed that if chloroplasts did not arise in egg cells from the beginning, the relationship between chloroplasts and their host cells would be symbiotic. The Russian biologist Konstantin Mirishkovsky proposed the first version of endosymbiosis in a publication in 1905. Following up on Schimper's work with chloroplasts, Mirishkovsky proposed that plastids are remnants of cyanobacteria that entered into symbiosis with a heterotrophic host, accounting for photosynthesis in plants. This host itself was the product of symbiosis between a large cell and a smaller symbiont that gave rise to the nucleus. In 1910, Mirishkovsky also created an evolutionary tree based on his hypothesis, in which endosymbiosis of chloroplasts was represented by branches uniting. In collaboration with Mirishkovsky, the American biologist Ivan Wallen published his findings on mitochondria in 1926 and proposed that the membrane-bound organelles in eukaryotes were once organisms of their own. However, for this to be accepted, mitochondria and chloroplasts would need to have DNA of their own, separate from the cellular DNA contained in the nucleus of eukaryotes. At the time, most biologists did not believe this to be true, and the endosymbiotic theory proposed by Mirishkovsky and Wallen was abandoned in favor of hypotheses of genetic mutations and duplications. During the 1960s, Lynn Margulis, a faculty member at Boston University, conducted research into the structure of cells. Margulis was aware of the similarities between chloroplasts and cyanobacteria that others had noticed, and was also aware that DNA had been found in both chloroplasts and mitochondria. With this knowledge, Margulis proposed that mitochondria were the result of endocytosis of bacteria capable of aerobic respiration, chloroplasts were the result of endocytosis of photosynthesizing bacteria, and that both the anaerobic host and engulfed bacteria benefited from this relationship. Many observations about eukaryotic organelles supported Margulis' endosymbiotic theory. Both chloroplasts and mitochondria have one circular chromosome that contains all of the organelle's DNA, similar to prokaryotic cells in size and structure. Both chloroplasts and mitochondria divide by binary fission and cannot be created from DNA instructions in the eukaryotic cell. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts have double membranes, thought to have been acquired when the vesicle that bacteria were absorbed into the cell through was not broken down. Ribosomes of chloroplasts and mitochondria are more similar to those of bacteria than those of eukaryotes. Proteins created by mitochondria and chloroplasts use the same amino acid at the start of the sequence as bacteria. After further research, Lynn Margulis published a paper on Symbiosis in Cell Evolution that laid out key principles of modern endosymbiotic theory. Modern endosymbiotic theory postulates that mitochondria arose earlier in evolutionary history, as almost all eukaryotes have mitochondria. 
a respiring bacteria was taken into a large archaeal host via endocytosis, but was not digested, resulting in the bacteria living inside of a smaller membrane within the host. The respiring bacteria allowed the host to efficiently obtain large amounts of energy, and the host provided the bacteria with protection and nutrients. Through gene transfer, the bacteria moved some of its genes to the host genome, but retained enough to produce RNAs and proteins vital to its function. Later on, a host with mitochondria already present engulfed, but did not digest, a cyanobacteria. Similar to respiring bacteria, the cyanobacteria and host provided each other with benefits, and the cyanobacteria transferred some of its DNA to the host, retaining the vital genes. Over time, the host and endosymbionts evolved and became inseparable, leading to the eukaryotic cells we know today. Thank you for watching, and as always, if you enjoyed, leave a like or a favorite, share the video with your friends, or even subscribe for more educational content. Check out some of the other videos on this channel, or check out the featured channels for more content.